Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this week's podcast. I am delighted to have a guest this week who combines being a business entrepreneur with giving back to society in a really major way. So without further ado, I'll let him introduce himself. Hi, Jonathan. Hi, my name's Mike Welsh. Um, I'm a tyre entrepreneur. I um, was a tyre fitter when I left school. Um, and with the help of the Prince's Trust, uh, managed to start my own business. And I've been doing the same, pretty much the same thing for the last 25 years. Um, um, now we're in a in a really fortunate position that we're working really close with the Prince's Trust, um, with our own trust, the Wells Trust, um, to try and support um, similar journeys for 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 kids uh, who need need support and help. Yeah, well, look, it really is lovely what you do, and I'm just I'm just deeply moved by the fact that someone's sending the elevator back down to help other people when you've done very well yourself. It's it's very easy to sit back and enjoy your success and the trappings of success but but it takes a, a special man or woman to remember um how lucky you've been and the breaks that you've had and try and do that for others uh, when you've uh, met other leaders mike that you've found really inspiring are there a couple of ceo level leaders that you'd like to call out who you found inspiring you've learned from yeah sure um so, i mean so terry lee he um is a great friend um, of mine today. He was uh, an investor in Black Circles, which was my uh, online tire business, um, or the most notable of, of the four. Um, and I met Terry um, because I wrote him a letter when I was um, starting Black Circles. I felt like I needed some some help learning how to retail. Um, and he was, he'd been voted, um, I think it was management today, Businessman of the Year or Fortune, sorry, Businessman of the Year. Um, so I I read the article. He's from Liverpool, you know, fairly tenuous, but I gave it a shot. Um, I got a letter back, and and um, he invited me for a cup of tea, and that was that. So, given the time to a young entrepreneur um, was something that he frankly didn't really need to do. I mean, you know, he'd taken Tesco from you know being so sort of sales of about four billion to seventy billion. He's right at his at his pomp at that point, you know, very busy man. Um, and he gave, you know, he gave me the time. And it, you know, a 30 minute chat was was two and a half hours later. And um, you know, and we've invested in things together since. And he was a fabulous um mentor for me, um, and taught me so much about some a lot of the fundamentals of of running a business, um, beyond the kind of the energy of just selling things, which is probably what got me out the out the gates and then you know you have to then learn the rest as you go and then the the, the second and probably actually the first would be uh, Sir Tom Farmer who was the founder of QuickFit um and a, a similar story actually I I started a a business pretty much out of school um selling tires uh, online and prior to that I was um uh, I was running um a parts department in a local garage I was in, installing tires um and i reached out to sir tom and again he invited me up to edinburgh met him and and really that's where that's really where the catalyst for my kind of journey began because he gave me the opportunity to get involved in their e-commerce team they 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 inverted commerce bought my business off me i was 18 um moved to edinburgh um got a little flat and then started to build quickfit.com over one of the quickfit centers ford bought quickfit i then ended up in detroit with forrester research and all of the kind of the big wigs at ford because e-commerce was the thing and kind of for them at least in 2001 whatever it was 2000 2001 um and then it and then it was just yeah the, the you know i was kind of you know i was lucky enough to to um to, to t- really take advantage of uh of a great opportunity he gave me and he was you know again a wonderful mentor and a and a real inspiration for me still to this day it's a real skill to be able to find somebody of that caliber not just once but twice um and what would be your advice to others who are listening who perhaps are starting out in their career and they're desperate for a mentor what would you what would your advice be yeah um just ask 
you know <laughs> i think it's you know, it, it, there's some kind of fundamentals to you know to that it's not it's not complicated set you know set the bar high you know aspire to be associated with people who inspire you from a distance um, your heroes if if you can call them that and 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 make contact and 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 you know and have you know I think for in both situations for me showing willing to learn being receptive to advice um is probably quite an attractive quality um that that kind of brings people like Sir Tom and Sir Terry along you know with you because you know if, if they see their words and advice being acted upon and 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 you being receptive um they want to give you more you know so so that, that that's probably yeah, but for me, it, it's 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 kind of having a, a probably a natural humility to be able to ask and then take advice from others. Um, yeah, is that's probably been my probably that's probably been the thing that's helped me the most in in regards to to getting support from from folks along the way. Yeah, and, and, and when I think back to people over the years that I've mentored, uh, it, it is very rewarding when you can see someone thriving on the advice that you share, because the difference between a coach and a mentor in very simple terms, someone once said to me is a coach has some great questions for your own answers. A mentor has some great answers to your own questions. And, uh, and, and there's that need to understand um, what is it that you should do in a situation where you've never been there before uh, or someone who believes in you. Um, yeah. and, and clearly they, they rightly both believe in you. Yeah, I think often, te- you know, certainly from Terry's perspective, there were some real lessons around, you know, numbers, understanding. You know, I mean, both those guys were, were I've seen them in, in their environments and their ability to navigate the numbers and get underneath. So you used to say, get underneath the numbers and really understand, you know, what the intrinsic links were back into the actions that were happening within the business. So he could read a set of numbers like a map. And that was, it was amazing to, to me. I really, cause I'm dyslexic. So, and, and dyscalculus. So it was always a challenge. I didn't give myself much of a chance when it came to a P and L and a balance sheet and a cash flow. But actually when I learned to understand the behaviors that were behind the numbers, it gave, it really brought them to life. So it, it, he helped me to navigate numbers not as numbers as actions and as consequences so it be, so then it became my kind of go-to I, i'm most comfortable now with a set of numbers um because it you know it talks to the business uh, and the business yeah. talks to the numbers it's it's the link um so yeah so so but but sorry my point was going to be but probably more importantly than any of that along the way you know usually it was a you know best you know, you're asking me the question, but you're the best place with the answer. What do you think? And and it was validation of what I was thinking was really the probably the biggest lift for me on occasion when things were really tough or what I, I didn't think, you know, because as you say, you turn the court, every corner, there's a new, you know, there's a new situation waiting for you that you've never been in before. So, you, you, but trust your gut instinct, stick to the knitting you know, you'll find the way. And and usually people like that giving you encouragement is 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 worth a lot. It's worth an awful lot. And it, it's a lovely connection. I don't know whether we made it before, but I also am dyslexic and suffer from dyscalculia. I can't even pronounce the dyscalculia. I often fall over that bit. And um and I and I remember I was going for a job in McKinsey um or price waterhouse coopers but the mckinsey one was all about the numbers in your mental math in your head and um even though i got through about the fourth round of interviews and was doing pretty well i just blew out on that one as a tire mine was definitely hit a pothole and uh, hmm. it didn't just have a bulge it, it, it burst and so that i always felt like it was in an inadequacy but now i found it's a sort of superpower because here i am interviewing leaders like you um, because I love chatting and I'm interested in people. Um, and so I think it was my mother who said, you know, don't worry, while you can't uh, be good with numbers and spelling, you'll be you'll be good with people. And so yeah. I think we, we need to find our skills, but it, it's lovely that you uh, have that ability to read numbers like a map, but, but as actions for connecting you to the business. I think that's a really clever one. 
Um, taking it from from those two leaders and their experiences and and their mentoring of you, um, fill us in if you would a bit more with the uh, experiences that have shaped you as a leader we meet today, um, and you know how did they shape you? What were those events? Yeah, I mean, I've probably got some fairly kind of marked situations that I can point to. Probably the first, um, you know, back to kind of coming out of school um, with with very, you know, with very few uh, GCSEs, O levels to really talk about. Um, so I didn't really have many options. So so taking a job. And getting into work was was something I wanted to do, but also it was kind of you know it was it was the avenue that really the only avenue was really open to me. So it was so, so going into work and then feel you know wanting to show um, that I was good at something, you know. So the job that was available to me was in you know fitting tires, installing tires, as we'd say over in here in the, in the states. Um, and that, you know, that really set me, obviously set me down a path, really, because my, I, I, because I wanted to be good to prove that I could do something, to prove I wasn't a failure. I just took in as much information as I could and really doubled down on the task of installing tires. That was, I wanted to be the best tire installer on the planet. I mean, that was kind of my obsession. And, and in doing that, I started to really understand the product, the customer, the market inadvertently it wasn't a business plan i was writing it was a business plan that was developing in in the background really um so when i was made redundant from that job um I, you kind of look to what you know what options do i now have and and you know certainly my over that 18 months or so my area of expertise had become car tires and 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 the gap in the market for me was obvious at that point so you know that that you know that was certainly a, the the catalyst to be in this market. Um, then to get into business and be you know be out on my own, um, I couldn't find another job. I couldn't get another job, so I went to the job centre, and the Prince's Trust had a had a poster in there to you know encouraging um, people like me to go and speak to them about starting a business or getting into a, into particular career um so i did that with my tire idea and they helped me build a business plan and we talked about you know that how that might evolve and the internet was something that was certainly you know was was on the horizon if it wasn't you know it was, it was there it was this was 96 97 97 97 so it was happening but it, I, did, I couldn't envisage it being something that i would run an internet business i just wanted to sell tires So they invited me to um, to go and kind of see how they operate and take my business idea and, and help me build a business plan, a really basic business plan, but a business plan nonetheless, um, and look forward to what the you know how we might develop that into the internet. And and again, at the point in time, it was it was a footnote to you know a way in which I could get back into work. Um, I hadn't really thought about kind of building an internet business at that point um so that was so so we did that and you know it's kind of a very basic kind of dragon's den type you know setup they had there which was you know which was great you kind of a challenge in front of some local business folks and that got me a 500 pound grant which got me a computer and then i um, was given an office in uh, egbeth above an ethel austin store with uh, which is where the Chamber of Commerce was based with a guy called Hugh, who was who ran the Chamber of Commerce, and he became my first mentor. Um, and that's really where it all started. So I was mm. selling limousine tires, was my kind of my specialism at the time. So selling selling limo tires from Egbeth above an Ethel Austin's. Um, and quite quickly I kind of realized that that the cost of advertising was was high. So referred back to this internet note on this two-page business plan and start to look into that and and built a website and you know could change my pricing you know could put strip ads in the magazines referring to the website as opposed to having to change prices on a on a on a magazine ad which was expensive and 
um, wasn't dynamic. So um, that really is where it all started for me. Fantastic. And if you look at your life, we, we have some highs and we have some lows. But what would be one of your darkest moments in your life? And what did it teach you? I think, I think my, my father passing away a couple of years ago is you know, without doubt one of the biggest challenges I've ever had. Um, you know, I'm, I was fostered and then adopted into, into my, my family with my mum and dad. And throughout my life, my, um, the importance I put on them and their role in helping me get a life and get ahead, um, is has been oversized. I mean, I can't, you know, I can't probably emphasize enough how important their role has been to me or, or my acknowledgement of their role has been to me from such an early age, you know, from kind of as, as long as I can remember pre five years old. Um, and that, you know, that, so him passing was, was really difficult. I didn't realize how difficult until, till such time. So, um, but what it, you know, what did it teach me? Um, it, it definitely taught me that, you know, that life is, is, is fleeting. I mean, everybody kind of, you, when people say life's too short, you've got to live for today, you know, only get one chance, all of these sort, sort of comments about getting on and, and doing all you can do with the life that you've been given, I think their comments and their kind of lines and, and, you know, but when you actually experience somebody close to you passing, I think that's when that stuff really comes home to roost. And just from my perspective, I've got a family, I've got three kids. Um, and, you know, I've always invested a lot of time and energy in them, but what this helped really helped me to do, nothing changed from a, from a, kind of a, a balance if you want to call it that but my emotional investment shifted quite materially so I've always been very emotionally invested in in my work um to a fault you know my I can work hard and and I can be um conscientious about what I do but it doesn't necessarily have to carry the stress and anxiety that it that it perhaps has in the past. And I think that really, that was just a tipping point. I just changed it. I didn't even have to think about it. It just stopped. And that's made me much better at, at running a business. And because it's not life or death, you know, that stuff is is separate. That lives somewhere else in, in my ecosystem, in my world, in my life. Um, and actually, you know, misplaced, um, emotion into things that really don't warrant that investment take away from the areas that really do inevitably yeah. and i and i've been i i early days i've been a i, I was going to say i've been a victim of that i would say other people in my life have been a victim of that kind of curse that that i kind of bestowed upon myself so it's not too late i'm still in my early 40s you know mm -hmm. i kind of you know my an investment in continue to invest in my business, my career, my, you know, but, but in a much more, um, a much less emotive way, I think. And, and I think yeah. that's going to be good for all of us. It is interesting. And, and I relate strongly to that, not only just for myself, but for many of the leaders I am honored to coach that, that we all at some stage have become successful because we've thrown ourselves in heart, body and soul emotionally invested in the business we're in or the career we have i was an army officer for 20 years i gave so much to it but i think my overcommitment to my military career probably cost me my first marriage and uh, this is not unusual for people to be almost a workaholic that they mm -hmm. give they give everything to the job and they are successful um, according to society but are they really successful and I, I think the measures now are caught in my relationship with my wife, Lee. I've remarried and uh, been, been married now nine years. They're caught in my relationship with my own two daughters, my uh, stepson, stepdaughter, my, my, my grandchildren, my, my stepson. Um, those are what matter. 
And uh, my brother died 18 months ago. It was very quick, 18 months from diagnosis of cancer to, to him dying at home with palliative care. And you think, what really matters? And what really matters is, you know, your inbox is going to be full when you're, when you're in your coffin. Um, but they will always remember how you made them feel. And small moments like having a, I took my two daughters, Harry and Brownie, we went to Dubai and we had dad and daughter time. It was really, really special. I mean, and now this year, both daughters are getting married, getting all well with my ex-wife and she's going to be there. I'm going to be happy to meet her and my wife's going to be coming with me. And yeah, that's what's special, you know, family and you, you know, yours, children uh, are 11 months two years and six years I seem to remember when we talked about uh, your wife Victoria and and those are very young so you can influence them in a massive way and one final thought was uh, I did this year the Hoffman Institute program which is really great looking back at your childhood mm -hmm. and who were your primary carers and um, and um that it shapes the kind of leader you are today and the behaviors that you have today from what went on and you clearly like me had you know quite a eventful young life and um there will be some patterns of behavior that you need to revisit because they're not serving anymore they might have got you to where you are now but but from the 40s into your 60s there's something else i don't know what thoughts come up for you yeah, for sure. And I think that kind of rebalance is really important and, and healthy. You know, I kind of, I do invest quite a lot of time in really trying to understand the patterns because patterns really are what kind of make, or they kind of define the outcomes and, and, and observing those and being able to, to change them, to create new patterns and to stop old patterns is, it's not easy, but it's a worthwhile exercise on a kind of constantly it's funny you say we kind of sit 40 to 60 I mean certainly you know I think before my dad passing I kind of was starting to feel similar to that but um that was certainly the that yeah that was certainly the cat the catalyst um for for you know but but it just happened you know it wasn't a you know I didn't have to work too hard um to kind of see those changes they yeah. just you know I was ready I was probably yeah. prepped myself, and that was the that was the the kicker. I think so. I think to have this level of self awareness, mutual awareness, and an understanding uh, of the people who were your primary carers in your case, you were um, you know adopted, and, and and how they did the best they could, and the compassion for them, and the values that they had. Um, no, I, I think. I think there's a lot when we go back and we look at our childhood, up, certainly up to the age of 13, massively influential. And what they say is that we try and avoid um, love, uh, negative love or a deprivation of love. We're, we're desperately seeking to be loved and approved. And, and therefore we'll do certain patterns of behavior where either we copy other people or we do the, diamet the diametrically opposite. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I think we're never too old to start looking at our patterns of behavior and deciding what got me here, will it get me there? Because as I'm moving on to the next stage and certainly being a parent to, to three, they're learning you. They're not, not the fine words that dad says, but, but how does dad behave? Yeah. I think the behavioral piece is, is absolutely critical. Yeah. You know, and that, yeah, and that it in a similar way, actually to, to run in a business and lead in a team, um, there are so many similarities, you know, in, in, in the do as, you know, the, a do as I um, say, not as I do type attitude is it gets, it gets you nowhere. So you've got to walk the walk and it, and the same applies to, to, to your kids. And, you know, I, well, I'm learning, I'm just learning every day and it's great, you know, because it's not, we can't control all the outcomes. Mm. It's probably something else I've learned. Yeah, I like, to I like to fix things. Yeah, I like to I, con control things, bring I, them into a, a soft landing. Kids yeah. don't let me do that. Yeah, no, no. I, I think, I think, and particularly where you had no control over your early life, and you know, fostering and adoption and what was going on, 
that you know i i had no control over the fact my father was killed flying you know i was two and a half and suddenly we had no dad and and so i think there's an element of me tries to control as much as i can of my environment but the more i read and learn about things like the daily stoic or marcus aurelius and epictetus and seneca the more i realize that the only thing i can control is my thoughts and sometimes you, your thoughts do run away with you so that takes work and mindfulness but the actions i decide to take and at times i think i've had poor judgment other times good judgment and that's where you you sort of try and go into a role or a calling where you make the good judgment calls and it seems that you know tar the tar business and being an entrepreneur there really has suited you um thinking about you you started out so young there's many who are listening who've got young children themselves so my question was really what bit of advice do you wish you had when you started out age 16 to 18 knowing what you know now if you went back to the future and, and met the young mike welsh what bit of advice would you give I was going to say be patient, but but actually that's probably that's probably not the right advice because um, that's uh, we would you know I wouldn't have kind of managed to get through a lot of what I managed to get through if I was patient. I think that's it's partly a a character trait that that is is more of benefit than it than than not. Um, but just go easy on yourself. So keep, you know, don't be patient, but just, you know, don't be impatient with yourself. Yeah. Um, because there's been many occasion, you know, building various businesses where, you know, I've just created so, you know, you kind of create so much anxiety and pressure from, from what's up here and expectations that you set for yourself or, or expectations that you put on others back to yourself which are which are ill-founded um so i you know and i think with mature maturity experience age you know um you kind of you know well certainly from my experience you kind of get there but i but if i was coached as a young man i think i would have probably had more fun i don't necessarily think i'd have got any further um but i think i'd have probably enjoyed the journey more than I than I have. I think I made it quite hard for myself. I, I really strongly relate to that, Mike. And I think back, I was terribly intense and, and very driven to prove something and strive and achieve and ambitious. And I think I could have lightened up a bit. And one of the things I learned on the Hoffman Institute program was this whole area of compassion. Um, I've got a small dog here who's being very compassionate to me. Uh, she's nine months old. She's in season at the moment and she needs a lot of love from her dad. So hence those who are listening can't tell that she's sitting on my lap, but those who watch YouTube will see a dog sitting on my lap. Um, and and I, I think the thing I've learned is about, you know, greater compassion for yourself helps others. So uh, psychologically, they say that you are the limiter on your relationship with others. In other words, if you're, really hard on yourself you're going to be really hard on others and and if you have a kindness and a love and a compassion for yourself that amount that you love and give compassion to yourself is the limiter on how much you can love victoria and your kids so i think you're right to to point that out that um being somewhat easier on yourself i mean uh, I, i'm sure many people feel that they achieve great success in society and wealth and you know businesses and bought and sold by being driven and you know relentless and workaholics but yet there's so much collateral damage in relationships and and other people around you in other words you, you don't have any car crashes but you see lots around you and you haven't made the connection between the the other cars wrecked around you and and yours or you the other analogy i find quite powerful is you you climb to the top of the ladder and you find it's leaning against the wrong wall. It's one mm -hmm. analogy. What, what comes up for you? Yeah, no, I, I, I get that. I think, I think, um, I think that we often, we used to, I mean, I've been doing this, like I say, 25 years. Um, 
when I started, a lot of the relationships, friendships, business relationships that I have today, that I didn't have then, but the journey has continued. So within accumulation of contacts, failures, successes, you know, um, experience, um, you know, I can kind of look down back on a 25 year track, but my, you know, my, my nearest and dearest, you know, friends, as I say, colleagues, family, um, you know, some, their path with me might only go back a handful of years. Mm. So there's always that kind of, that's that kind of life before life, you know, our, li our lives in terms of our relationships, I think are compartmentalized into the amount of time, obviously the amount of time that we've, we've kind of coexisted. I think sometimes, um, you know, sometimes it's kind of, it's, it's kind of good to not kind of bring all the weight of history into today's relationships or into the kind of, because, you know, that can bring a burden of what feels like a burden of responsibility onto others who had no part in that, who mm. had no, you know, my history is my history, my experiences are my experiences. And I've got to bring the benefit of that to today, not the burden of that to today in terms of other people. So, you know, and, and I think you've got to be cognizant of the fact that what you, of what you bring, you know, if you have got an intensity to that track record or to that path, you know, don't, you know, you got to bring the positives to bear as much as possible. Don't, you know, and, and, and that's a, for me, that's been a, that's been a real kind of, that's been, I've, I've, I've had to become very aware of that, you know, and actually use the experiences in a positive way like this, you know, today, why, why are we talking today? Why, you know, why did, you know, because hopefully some of these experiences and lessons, other people can, can take some, you know, draw some comparisons to, or take some benefit yeah. from. Um, yeah. It's not my cross to bear. It's my experience to share. Yeah. That's a, a very good way of putting it. And, and over the years, I'm sure you like me may have burnt some relationships that you had, you could have got it better or you had to let someone go who was really not healthy to be in your life. Would you talk about without mentioning anybody in particular, any experiences that way? I think there's loads of that, isn't there? I mean, you kind of, particularly in business, you, you, there's lots of situations where you kind of, you've got to, you got to do the best. You got to, you learn probably being in business so long and having businesses, small businesses for such a long time. The decisions, the difficult decisions you make, you learn to make them earlier, the longer you, you go on. Because frankly, in the beginning, Nobody wants to make these tough decisions. So you you tolerate, you know, whether it be colleagues or employees for longer than ordinarily I think you would. Um, but then you learn that actually the sooner you can handle these sorts of situations, the better it is for everybody. So I think you kind of, for me, I've kind of learned, there's been lots of situations, actually too many to recount, but you learn to, to, to try and deal with contentious, situations however they manifest themselves as early as possible as soon as you sense them and that usually leads to a better outcome for everybody the longer you let these the kind of the bad fit scenarios kind of rest the the, the more painful ultimately it is for everybody yeah it's very very profound i'm, I'm just uh, you know, thinking about the fact you're talking just from miami in america uh i'm curious what the connection? How did you go from being in Scotland, where you met your wife Victoria, to being mm -hmm. now working in the United States of America? Yeah, the, the at Black Circles, this was always a, a, an opportunity I wanted to open up in terms of the business, and 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 it's exciting. It's the biggest market in the world for in our industry. It's mm. it's it's mass. It's it's it's, it's massive. Um, so to 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 have a hill to climb, you know, to have a challenge to take on with something that, you know, something I wanted to do, um, 
and then we sold the business to Michelin. And, you know, that was kind of slightly disappointing. It was a great outcome. We were delighted to exit, but at the same time, it felt like it was unfinished business. So we gave that, you know, kind of year or so, and I still wanted to do it. So um, had that conversation as a family, you know, was there a lifestyle opportunity here in terms of a change to dovetail with having a, having a go at this kind of hill, if you want to call it. Um, and we, we, we got to yes. So there's a number of reasons why Miami, I mean, the weather's great. The commute's not bad from the UK. Um, the environment for business is good. You know, commuting around the country to suppliers is 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 good. Flights are good, so kind of all the tick boxes. So we we came yeah. and we can we could commute from the UK to Miami for a while. I was kind of coming and going, and then things started to do quite well. And um, yeah, we kind of made the move, and then we uh, quite quickly after we we ended up striking a merger deal with with one of the largest online tie retailers here. Which which created a much bigger business that we now own a, a big part of, and and that's what we're we're building out um, today. So you know, being in market was very useful to get a deal done and and to to realize the opportunity. And kind of what I realized actually from a business perspective, we kind of needed to be in market. You know, we were never going to be able to do this at arm's length, um, and that's that's certainly paying paying back dividends. But also from a a family from a personal perspective. Um, it's proved a really good experience for everybody. You know, my mm. my two year old's talking. You know, he's 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 as fluent in Spanish as he is in English, you know, quite quite quickly. Um, and my uh, my eldest is is having a great time in his school. And like I say, the environment's so far so good. Great. No, I'm really pleased for that. And. And that leads me on to, you know, your success as a high performing business leader fits with the, the model that we've done of the Inspire Leadership Compass, the, the eight elements of it. So I'm just going to chat a bit around that compass and maybe you'd share one or two personal tips. So the first one is moral quotient. Um, and my question there is, uh, what did you learn when you let your own values slip? I mean, it's a great question. I, I think um, I'm a very values-driven person. Um, and sometimes that reduces the opportunities for, for me uh, as a business person, um, which is fine. That's that's the moral compass that, you know, that that is that I kind of hold really quite important. To me and to 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 how we how we operate um, our our various businesses, um, but on occasion, and it's you know, and, and there's always an occasion. You know, we kind of don't trust your gut, and you take you make a move. Um, I think it hardens your resolve. I think it. I think that's how you learn your lessons. Um, I don't think it's possible to really understand what those guide rails are. And what's really important to you until you cross them. Yeah. You know, that's how you compound that position. That's how you kind of set out what, you know, where the where, what where the values are for you, what that, you know, what what's important to you. Um, I think you've got to kind of test and learn a bit. Um, otherwise you, you know, it's hard to measure. So I think I think there's less of that as time goes by because you understand, you know, you get more hard set in 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 what that as I say those guardrails look like and, um, but there's a you know there's it's quite you know I, I for me personally it's, it's usually where I don't trust my gut, where I make a decision that's not that's based on something outside of that, um, and and I, and then I spring right back to to the kind of that where I should have been in the first place. Yeah. I mean, it, it's something that I've um, regretted when I uh, let things slip for an opportunity or advancement or whatever it might be and, and not stuck to my values. Uh, and what I found serves me well in the last few years where I've slipped up far less 
is to imagine a collection of my almost like my support team my late father um you can see his hat at the back there the naval officer the fast jet pilot my mother who was a philanthropist like you and did lots of good for people who are far less fortunate than her and then people like you know living people like uh general lord dennett who is to me a bit like uh terry was to you um yeah and you'd have your terry and your tom and and your late father um as part of a group almost like standing around you when you're alone in a room making a decision which apparently no one else will know about but they're all going to know about it and and i find ha, what would they do you know in my circumstance would i be proud if they knew what i was thinking not even just mm -hmm. what i was about to do mm -hmm. but what i was thinking and that has served me well does, does that have any resonance for you yeah i think so i think that's right um and you know that and that you kind of want to get to a place where you have set your own patterns to that extent to that end so mm -hmm. you know you kind of you start to you get your own rhythm so I think your rhythms inform to your point is informed by either your perception or experience of how others behave and those that you respect um and and that gives you that that sets out some you know some some guide rails and I think then you form your own um you form your own patterns and I think that is you know that that really sets you in good stead um yeah but we're all going to fail at some time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you, if you don't fall outside of that, then you never really understand what good looks like. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, the more no, you fail, you fail, as they say, fail fast, you know. And fail forward. Um, no, I, I, I know those sayings. I think the thing that is useful to me is always to ask myself, what have I learned when it hasn't gone well or I didn't do right? What have I learned? What am I going to do differently now? That has happened. What, what have I learned? What am I going to do? Um, which takes me to the, the next of the eight components, which is um, PQ, meaning and purpose. What gives your life meaning and purpose, Mike? I mean, more than ever, my you know, my kids and and you know, as they're getting older, really looking at thinking about how they are gonna think about me as they get older and perhaps when I'm gone, you know, we think about, um, you kind of legacies, quite a grand word probably to use, but, but legacy is, I guess, equates to memory and, and, and how do you want to be kind of, you know, how do you want to be thought about, you know, as when you're not here and that, mm -hmm. that's probably formed a, it's formed a much bit, a much more prominent part of, my decision making as we move forward, particularly in the charitable stuff that we do and um and the decisions I make on from a business perspective, which plays back into the philanthropy piece. It, it's it's a it's a key one, I think. You know, uh, the analogy again is that you're going into a church and there's quiet organ music playing and it's very somber. And there's one of those coffins which is still open, so you can see the the smartly dressed body of the person who's died. And as you go forward, it's you. And people file in. And a good friend is going to speak about your eulogy. One of your children is your wife, um, work colleagues. What what would you like them to say? What are they going to say now? Is that good enough for you to be remembered that way? Or what would you like them to say? And what's the delta between the two of what they would say today and what you'd like them to remember you by? Uh, because, um, you know, I, I still have very fond memories of, of my mother and my father. And they are an inspiration to me from long beyond the grave. Yeah, no, I, I think that I think that's it's um I think that every day you make this you know, certainly from my perspective, every day there are decisions to be made. And as I say, for me it's more I've got a, a much clearer vision now on the consequence of those decisions. So 
it's not for t- today or tomorrow. It's it, where, where it matters. It's it's about okay, how does this play? Where does this lead me? What you know, ultimately, how does this kind of chime with with the vision? To your point, and, if, and for me, it's it's to be, you know, nobody's gonna, you know, they don't write on your headstone about the number of businesses you sold or that you know the car that you drove or the house that you lived in. It's about you know the love to to your kids and your your family and it's your, and I think that's the piece that probably resonates the most is if I'm present and I mean present with my family not just physically emotionally you know in terms of how I invest for want of a better term in them and I might just be playing with the cars on the floor with my son for an hour but she just delights in it's like that time is is really really important and it's you know and and that you know kind of reframing and we talked about how that really has come about for me in the last few years that reframing kind of gives me comfort because I, I i don't i feel like i have the right at least line of sight into what's important now for the long term how that shapes out you know when people are giving a eulogy or whatever i don't know i mean that that that's up to them i can just do the best i can do to give people a reason to feel proud you know yeah no and i'm i'm just want to just acknowledge this is a really powerful quite a deep conversation a slow pace um you know we we talked about the fact that i've been pretty unwell um before this but it, it actually in some ways has slowed me down to ask some really pertinent questions and really listen to you and so thank you for that um health is the next question hq um how do you keep yourself healthy like yeah I'm, i've kind of i've always tried to exercise keep fit eat well you know not drink too much you know stay try and stay as young as i can um and i like you know certainly in the last 10 years you know i'll kind of exercise i'll walk every day in four or five miles probably every day and i'll work out me three three days a week um you know and 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 that just gives me mentally as much as physically probably more so mentally um a recovery from the intensity of life so you know my if you like my um my my energy comes from from that from feeling um recovered from having thinking time from having you know and i i find that really kind of comes to life not you know some people meditate some people kind of you know there's all kind of different ways and means but for me walking whether it be walking listening to a book or or taking calls even or just listening to nothing you know not listening to anything but just kind of being active is is um is a really important part of my day of my week no it sounds like you've you've um got that right it's a, such an important area particularly the food we eat because you can never outrun a crap diet and uh <laughs> america um like britain we're not very far behind 93.5 percent are metabolically unhealthy because the standard american diet is so bad for you yeah um I, I yeah the co- the cost of living is is in, in certainly in cities like this is is really very high um but you can still pick up a mcdonald's meal for two dollars so you know the, the 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 investment in health in in the more impoverished parts of this country is is non-existent you know yeah. fast food you know is still the the staple um so there's work. There's there's a lot of work to be done there for sure. Yeah, and, and um, yeah, it, it's something that I I care deep about. Read about it a lot and listen to it. Um, try out different things uh, as as you have done. Emotional intelligence is the next one. I, I was worried, curious. I'm I've been chatting with Oscar Trimboli, who's written a great book on how to listen. And uh, Oscar talks about the five levels of listening, listening to yourself, the chatter that's going on in your own head, then listening for 
context in what someone's talking about, listen to the content, listening for the unsaid, I think it's a great skill, and then listening for the meaning of it all. But uh, how do you listen well to others? Yeah, it's quite a skill. What well, One mm. that I'm still certainly trying to um, perfect. Um, I think... I think it's it's the it, it, I think there's no replacement for kind of one to one interaction. So being able to see and understand the physical positioning of somebody in in the context of the con- of the conversation, I think you learn a lot. I think you know in a world where we have a lot of Zoom, you know, kind of WhatsApp. You know all these you know, different ways to com- you know Google Meets, different ways to to connect. I think with that we we've, we've lost some of the interpersonal integrity that comes with communication, um, and I think that's a worry. Because certainly in the context of business, I think it's it's easy to read a message or hear a voice, you know, over the wires and and conclude you know on your own on your own basis what where that individual is coming from i think i think that we need to be more interpersonal we need to have more relationship based um insights um otherwise you know context is 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 you know is gets lost quite quickly and quite easily so 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 to that end i i think trying to meet with with your team trying to kind of understand properly where they're coming from and, uh, and and get underneath the words to your point and really kind of dig dig deep. I mean I try and I don't really try at it. I you know I I'm a very open person, you know, very um relationship orientated. So again in the past that's possibly been to a fault. <laughs> but it, but actually it's probably been something that's helped me relate to people to my team, to my family. Um, and actually, I would say as I've become more, if you like, professional or, I, or I've been professionalized over time with business, it's it's helped me in some instances, but it's probably helped me less, certainly in, in my personal relationships, you know, because, you know, you've got to be able to draw the line between. I would rather be a personal, you know, kind of interact on a personal level on a personable level, sorry, than on a professional level, because I think the first and day is a much more genuine reaction, and you get a lot further with people when they believe you. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so 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 the kind of whole bit, the business environment, and the way we structure meetings, and the way we, you know, we we have a day of meetings and conference calls, and you know, all of that stuff. I think it it kind of it can dilute the value of communication we we need to communicate less but we need much higher quality communication Uh, uh, ideally uh, on a ideally on a one-to-one basis yeah and very real conversations where people feel seen and heard probably for the first time in some cases they really feel that somebody else understands them that's hugely motivating particularly the ability to connect with someone uh spot on um you're over in America and you're going to meet people very different from you and your upbringing. How do you, how do you get on with people who are very different from you? Yeah, I think again, to, to that point, I think being genuine and being open, you're almost irrespective of cultural differences, I think is it, it brings it authenticity with it. So I think if you can do that without faking it, I think that's a great start. Um, and I think that opens the door for that to be reciprocated. So I find it probably e- easier than I would if I would bring in a you know a, a much more kind of a kind of a, if you like a colder communication kind of business type approach. So I think being open, being honest, you know, and that integrity, I think, encourages you know a, a genuine interaction with people and i've i've certainly experienced that since i've been here and it, but look we're all you know we're all different that being said you know when i was operating black circles from 
or, or what my other business is from up in Scotland. It was quite. It was. It was almost the same as dealing with people in London, right? I mean, it's <laughs> whether whether you're from Miami, South Florida, or whether you're from London and you're dealing with a live a scouser up in Scotland, we're all different. Mm. No, we 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 certainly are. And I was just thinking there as you're talking about Scotland, London, uh, Miami, that you you've had some real trials and tribulations setting up businesses businesses perhaps not working and then it does or you get let down by someone who cheats on you or lies to you or steals money from the business how have you picked yourself up in times of adversity uh, it's, 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 it's a great question because when you operate with your try and operate with full integrity and without the veil of a business approach, if you like, um, it hurts, you know, it's tough. Um, but I've found rather than resisting that, letting that actually sink in fully and taking the pain fully um, really helps to shape your decision-making, those guide rails we talked about earlier those the resilience that you 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 can adapt to helps you reframe what's important um helps you not misplace trust caring you know things that you would you know perhaps borrow from family and put them into business get the balance right so i think i think without and this we were talking about patterns earlier if you know without when when if the patterns are wrong Usually, the way to change that is to is to is to associate pain with the wrong patterns and pleasure with the right patterns. And I, and I think that you know when things don't go right, don't run away. Take it on, because you know fundamentally that's oh, there's so much learning and so there's there's more learning in the bad experience than invariably than in, in the good experiences. And the, yeah. and the more the more you do learn. The more able you are to 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 create more good experiences moving forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think someone said to me once, "I learned so much from my mistakes. I think I'll go and make a few more." Um, we're at the end of our time, and so I just ask you to introduce yourself again in a moment and share your two-minute top leadership tip, Mike, for others to 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 learn from. Okay. Yeah. So, Mike Welsh. Um, CEO of Tire Buyer and the Welsh Trust. Um, yeah, my my tip really would really centre on trust your instincts. You know, it's very difficult when you're starting out in business or you're early on in a career um, to to know where to go next when maybe you know you've got tough decisions to make or. Um, or you've you know you're up against it, and I would always say that invariably your instinct, or what you might refer to as your gut, um, probably won't let you down. So in my experience, the majority, if not all, of the poor decisions I've made, I've not trusted my gut. Um, mm -hmm. And probably second to that, ask for help. Um, where Again, where you feel if if you're in a similar situation, you 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 feel like you've run out of reference points personally. You know, perhaps you're not as experienced in the field as, as as you will be. Reach out to the the best people that you feel could give you the answers to your questions, and just ask, and you'll be surprised. Yeah, well, um, Mike Welsh, OBE, and congratulations for that for all the work that you've done for others. Thank you very much for being on the Inspire Leadership Podcast. You are truly an inspiring leader and it's been a real honour having you here. Thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate it.